my father's cult offered them a promise of a better life if they followed him. Don't think that I care more for my own flesh and blood than I do for you. I would gladly kill her if you asked it of me. I didn't see people crying and being beaten up in the way I was. Oh no, she'll be all right. All she needs to do is focus on AB. And then she threw herself out of the second floor window. Even if you came there to challenge him for murdering your whole family, he would somehow convince you that what he did was right. In today's world, there are so many incredible and extraordinary stories of survival. Stories about fighting against the odds, overcoming the toughest situations and never giving up. Stories that need to be told and heard. Stories that can change our perspective on life, offer us empowerment, teach us how to deal with difficulties and give us inspiration to find inner strength. My name is Iris Enthoven and you're now listening to They Survived. In a seemingly ordinary neighborhood of London, a young Katie experienced a life that was anything but common. For three decades, she was confined by her own father, who was an abusive cult leader. He sought to control every aspect of her existence, as well as he did with all the other women in the cult. For 30 years, her world was limited to this house, where she experienced manipulation, fear, abuse and isolation. Today. We journey into the heart of darkness that was her life until she eventually escaped. She had to learn about everything for the first time when she was thrown into this new world. Welcome, Katie. Thank you for Hello. joining us today. Mm -hmm. So what do you remember from your early childhoods? I grew up in this cult in London. Who I, the, the leader was, I later learned, was my father. And, and my mom was also one of his followers. And there were... A number of other people as well. The The cult started as a, a very extremely far left group in London in the 60s and 70s and at the beginning the recruits were students and nurses from Malaysia and other countries who had come to study or to work in the UK and, um, and then it kind of moved to South London. It seemed to attract people who had been, who people who felt disenfranchised with the society as it was and people who were looking for some form of utopia. And my father's cult kind of offered them like a promise of a, of a better life if they followed him. At the beginning, sounded really good they i mean they used to do things like fundraise for charity to help people in the community which to to an unsuspecting person would seem like a really good thing and the message was like likes it it seemed like it was a good thing but the agenda was very different it was very radical very um authoritarian and I think the idea that my father had was to create a communist dictatorship in the UK. And then as time went on, it became even more weird and freaky. It was like, like a quasi-religious organization where he was considered to have supernatural powers. And, that, and he used to say things like that he was, he was the... the secret ruler of the world. He believed that. He believed that he was the secret ruler of the world and the other members of the cult believed it too. And he used to say that the British fascist state, which is what he called them, were always targeting him because they knew who he really was. And so if, the, if they refused to pay their rent and the landlord rang or wrote to ask for the rent, that was an attack of the fascist state. If a neighbor spoke to them, that was an attack of the fascist state. If somebody played loud music, that was an attack of the fascist state. But they could do anything, but if anybody objected to their behavior, to their rudeness and disrespect to other people, then they were, you f you're a fascist agent, uh -huh. that kind of stuff. So he was so paranoid and delusional, and he believed that everybody was listening to him and that he was being spied on and you'd say you can't 
talk about things in case somebody's listening in and that kind of stuff and everybody was in the same house how does the yeah. house look like well the we moved a lot so it was like we stayed in one place and then if the landlord wanted to like sell the property or something then we'd we'd move out but then when i was seven years old we got evicted and that was because one of the main breadwinners who was one of the other uh, cult members they she left because she was being treated very badly and she decided to to leave so my dad said all right we're not going to pay the rent then we stayed there for a year like squatters and then we finally got evicted and then we moved to another place and then the other woman who was the who was going out to work and not just lazing about in the house like the other cult members mm -hmm. she also left and so that meant we really didn't have any very very little income there was my dad had uh, his sister-in-law was disabled so she brought in a little bit of benefits and he had a friend who used to help him out a little bit so we kind of lived on a very tight budget for a number of years until again we got evicted my dad said when i was age 10 he said i'm taking the collective into the welfare state to blow up the welfare state and the fascist state so what that meant was that we we were starting to claim benefits i mean not me but the other members of the cult so everybody was in the house and you were not expected to leave the house no well the other members of the cult were not allowed to leave on their own except the people who went out to work the they used to go out in pairs they had to go out in pairs even just to cross the road to go to the shop they always had to go in pairs and what my dad said was that this was to keep them safe but the real reason was to ensure that nobody talked about what was actually going on in the house or that there was always someone to spy if somebody just ha had any idea of telling others what was actually going on so can you tell me a little bit more of what was going on well when i was a kid all i remember seeing was people standing around for hours while my dad held forth shouting and cursing about this bad world that we're living in and i mean things that are real i mean there are things that are not good but he kind of said oh this is all because of this is all because of the crimes of the west and he is going to take over the world and make everything better and that there wouldn't be any suffering and that there wouldn't be any hunger or misery and but i started thinking but you are saying i thought to myself that when you take over the world there'll be no misery but this little place which you are ruling is extremely miserable so how are you going to make it happy on a large scale if you can't even make it happy in your own home that's yeah <laughs> good, good question <laughs> to ask yes and there was also a lot of violence right there was a lot of violence yes like if somebody dared to disagree or on the rare occasion somebody dared to disagree or very often it used to be because one person would report another person oh yes people so, keep an eye on each other that's yeah. right because they were all women who were basically head over heels in love with my dad and they were all competing to be his number one acolyte or his number one slave or whatever and the way to do that was to make somebody else look bad so if somebody said something that could be in any way construed negatively they would interpret it in the most unpleasant way ma imaginable so as to like if something was you know you can say something and it can be taken more than one way they would always sort of claim that the other person had said something that was really bad 
what happened then. So then there used to be like, he used to call it struggles or struggle session, which was like modeled on the struggle sessions from the Cultural Revolution in China, where one person would like have to sit on their knees or kneel on the floor and everybody else will surround them and start telling them off and telling them what they had done wrong. And then my dad would slap them or sometimes people got black eyes, sometimes people's nose was bleeding and that sort of thing. And then whoever was the target would think of ways to take revenge within a couple of weeks and then it, the roles would be reversed on someone else. So they were like snitching each other to yeah. get beaten up. All the time, yes. It, your father was like, was it abuse only like physical and mental? Both, um, both. He was always, he was so scathing and withering with his comments. He really sort of put people down. What he used to do was encourage people to open up to him, sort of like, like almost like he was a therapist and encouraging that he was always encouraging them to tell him about things that happened in their past and things that they were unhappy about from their childhood or whatever. And then he'd use it against them. Somebody would tell him something in confidence and then he would tell the whole group about something embarrassing about a person in order to control them. What kind of women were it? Like they had to cut off the lines with their family or? Yes, they were not allowed to speak to their families except for his wife. Because he had it was a not wife. my mum, yes, and okay. my stepmother and her sister, they were allowed to see their families, but even then he was on a very restricted basis. Okay. And you're saying my mum, at a young age, you knew that he was your father and No, who? no, I didn't I didn't know that. I'm I know it now, mm -hmm. but at the time he we used to have to call him Comrade Bala. And my mum was called Comrade Shan. So that's that's how I knew them. And she was extremely unpleasant. Why? I don't know. I just think because she was my mum and she was, it was like she was trying to prove to my dad that I don't put my daughter before you. Just remember that I always put you before her. So she would go out of her way to get me into trouble with him. And it was like she, snitching on me was was her number one pastime to show to him her love yes that's right her loyalty is sort of like don't think that i care more for my own flesh and blood than i do for you i would gladly kill her if you asked it of me every all the women were less sort of brainwashed yeah with a loyalty absolutely brainwashed and the thought of him not being around was their greatest fear so if they, he would say something like we don't do this, this and this, I would just leave. They would just do anything, anything, literally. Do you have examples of extreme stuff they... Well, sort of the way they were treating me, they treated me extremely badly. And I mean, they knew that um, snitching on me would result in me getting beaten up when I was just a little girl, but they didn't care. They were happy to be part of it because it was more important to be seen as loyal to my dad than it was to not abuse a little girl. The moment you were born, like he knew he was the father, right? Yeah. What was yes. he telling to the group? He said that, well, this is what he told his wife, that it was electronic warfare that this woman got pregnant. And when she was pregnant, she didn't even know she was pregnant. She, he was told her that she has got, she's got wind. And that's why she was, why she was, why she had a big tummy it was because she had too much wind and she just didn't question anything. It was like she didn't have the ability to question. By that point, they were so enslaved and brainwashed that if he, if he had said, there's nothing on this table they would have believed it, even if though they could see with their own eyes that there are things on the table. What was his... And if you said that there was something on the table, they'd beat you up for saying, yes, but I'm sorry, I can see something on the table. I can see there's a glass there. But to them, if he said there wasn't a glass there, there wasn't a glass there. 
and you were wrong if you said that there was a glass there. And after that, when I read 1984 by George Orwell, where O'Brien says something about two plus two is five or something, I can't remember what it was, but that was, that reminded me of that. So you were born, but he has... He had his wife. Yes, uh, he was doing, I don't know much about, I don't know what was going on, but they they all were obsessed about him and all of them wanted to be, well, all of them wanted to be his wife, basically. But he had one wife. Yes, he did. How was she? She was awful. She was, I think because she was very jealous, because, I mean, obviously he told her that it was electronic warfare, but I think he she knew deep down that... I was his daughter, so she she just ghosted me. She used to slam the door in my face, or if I spoke to her, she'd just not say a word. And I used to think, am I invisible? She just doesn't see me. And the only time she would do something would be to push me or to say something horrible to me. But now you're referring to him as your dad? But yes. At that point... How, how I didn't know he was my dad. I just knew he was the leader of the cult. You just or, said like father or AB or... We used to call him Conrad Bala or AB sometimes. At this point, you were the only one who was born in a cult. Yes. Um, how was it for you? I, I can imagine that you don't know better, but you were also not able to go out. Like, do you have... You knew something about the outside world? I mean, I used to look out of the window... <clears throat> And that was forbidden, but I still used to do it. And I also used to read things in secret that I was not supposed to read. So I did get to know that there was other things going on. And I was always told that it was bad outside and that I was being kept safe by being in here in the house. But I always felt that everybody outside seemed to be having a lot more fun than I was. I didn't see people crying and being beaten up in the way I was. And I used to see people laughing and just enjoying life. And I wasn't allowed to do that. I was not allowed to laugh or giggle or... What happens when you laugh? I used to get punished for laughing. Because it was like, you are you are not being serious and you're a bad person because you laugh. What or, was like the the things you did every day? Because you're not allowed to read or go outside, was it like... We used to have to sing songs in praise of of A.B. And we used to have to write things down that he dictated to us. You know, like he would say that events in the world were linked to what was going on in the house. Like if he said something and something happened which was a bit similar to something he had said, it was that... Oh, you see, I'm in control. See, that happened over there, just like just like I had said. Or if there was a natural disaster after the landlord demanded rent, then <clears throat> he would say that it was punishment for the fascist state for demanding rent from the collective. Do people knew about your existence? No, I wasn't, nobody knew about my existence to my knowledge. I was, that's why I wasn't allowed to look out of the window because he was worried. Well, I think there were two reasons, really. He was worried that people will see me and he was worried that I would see things and get ideas that it was nicer outside than it was in the collective. So I was always hidden away and I wasn't allowed to go out. And the only time that I ever went out was as a child was when relatives came to visit you know like my stepmother's brother or her cousin or her uncle and auntie or something like that then I'd be spirited away so that they didn't see that I was living there they knew nothing nobody knew so nobody anything. knew nothing nobody knew anything about me at all and was it like that the house was locked or was it like was it well more of the, a mental... the doors were locked yes but there was always so many people around I mean Just imagine like a small two-bedroom or three-bedroom house and ten people in there, always in the house and always on the alert. There's no way you can just get up and go. And besides, I was always told as a child that it was dangerous out there and that you'd die if you go out of the house. 
So it was like I was terrified of going out of the house. Yeah. And I, I didn't know how to do it. It was just, everything was just so scary. And on the rare occasions I went out, which was like once a year as a child, it was so, it was so nice, but so overwhelming as well, because there was like so much new, so many um, sounds and smells and things to look at, which I had never seen before. And it was like, I couldn't take it in. It felt like just like a complete, I don't know what the right word is for it, but just complete sensory overload for me. That's what it was. And what what happened when maybe one of the women or you got ill? Um, Were you well, allowed to go to the no, doctor? No, we weren't allowed to go to the doctor. And that was partly why I suppose, why I used to wonder why I wasn't allowed to run about. And I think partly that was the, that was part of the reason because they didn't want me to like fall over and then break a bone and then have to go and see a doctor. And that was also one of the things they used to use to say that my life was somehow better than everybody else's. Like, oh, you've never even broke a bone. Look how well we look after you. Uh, but the real reason was they didn't want me to ever have to go outside. seek seek external help. Did you even had a passport? He didn't have a passport, no. So they, they didn't even uh, made an administration of you? No, I had a... Like a birth certificate. I had a birth certificate. That was all that I had, but I didn't know about it. But that was my only, that was the only form of registration that they they did. Were there other people like getting ill and were not able to do something about it? Um. Yes. Well, my mum started having severe um, mental health issues. She was becoming paranoid I mean more paranoid than usual and actually like seeing things that weren't there I mean the things that my dad said he didn't say that like there was an apparition in the room or something it was like that the fascist state was bugging us and all that okay I mean it's wrong but you can imagine that that could be in a alternative scenario that could be possible but to say that somebody is there when the, there isn't like, oh, there's somebody sitting on that chair and she started talking to them and it was like, there's nobody there. Who are you talking to? You know? So I realized that she was seriously, I mean, more seriously ill than she had ever been. And she, nothing she said was making any sense. And she kept saying she was a bad person and that she wanted to die. She didn't want to eat. And... And she was talking in such a weird voice as well. It was almost like she was possessed. And I said, I think she needs she needs some help. And they said, oh, no, she'll be all right. All she needs to do is focus on AB. And then she threw herself out of the second floor window and broke her neck. To me, I mean, there have been people who thought that she was murdered. But, I mean, I don't think, she, I cannot say that she was because nobody pushed her but she was pushed in another way she was driven to that position because for two reasons her life had become so unbearable that she felt that she wanted to die and also when she was getting totally out of hand nobody cared enough to ensure that she got some help so she died because of that and later on, another woman, she started having a lot of pain in her neck and she was feeling weird. And she said she wanted, she, she used to be a nurse. So she said she was worried and she wanted to see a doctor. And they said, no, you should just focus on AB. And then she died of a stroke. And as she was lying on the floor, they were shouting at her because they said that she was being difficult. She banged her head. And then she started feeling really weird and then she became unresponsive and they were spent about half an hour shouting at her thinking she was being disobedient when actually she was dying she was in a coma and nobody called the ambulance until it was too late was police like coming after like these two women who died yeah there, there were police involved but they spun the whole thing and somehow they managed to 
wriggle out of any form of accountability. But they get away with it. Yeah. And then there was another person who was, he, he wasn't living in the house, but he was a member of the cult. And he was, I mean, he was the only man who was around. And he had, I think he was, he had learning difficulties because he never used to speak at all. He barely said a word. And he was the sort of person who it was very easy to brainwash because he was like simple and he'd believe anything. And he started feeling, again, started feeling very unwell and struggling, struggling to even like have a we. And he said he wanted to see a doctor to find out what was going wrong with him. And again, he, the pattern was the same. He was told, just focus on AB and you'll be all right. And guess what? He died of cancer. His whole body was riddled with it by the time he got managed to get any help. And then after they died, after all these people died, my dad and stepmother would say, the fascist state killed them. The hospital didn't look after them. And I used to think to myself, I'm sorry, but I think you killed them because you neglected them. They had clear issues and you did not deal with it. And I think for you as a child, that's so incredible thinking because you didn't mm. knew anything about hospitals. And no, like I didn't. I didn't know much about it, but I had read stuff. And well, to be fair, these people, the... I mean, the woman who died of a stroke and the man who died of cancer, that was when I was in my 20s. But it was, I, I, yeah, no, I had never sort of, I've never, I'd never been to hospital myself. I visited my mum in hospital a few times, but I had never had the experience of medicine or knowing anything about that stuff. But I knew that it was possible to get help because my stepmother used to go to hospital for issues related to diabetes and related to she stomach was able issues. To go to the hospital. She was able she to and go. AB were the only people able to Well A B didn't used to go, but he said he didn't need doctors. He was he was invincible. So because he didn't used to he didn't really get sick that much. Mm -hmm. So he he put that down to being invincible. But actually towards the end he was almost blind, almost deaf, and he had diabetes and he also had dementia, but that was only diagnosed after he went to prison because before that he was clearly falling apart, but no, he's perfect. He doesn't need to see a doctor. Were there other women you had a good relationship with? Yes and no. It was, it was very temperamental. So for a short period, I could sort of build a little bit of a connection with somebody but their loyalty to AB and the cult was far more than their loyalty to me as a friend so if if they if AB had said something which they could take to mean that they shouldn't be carry on being friendly towards me then they would turn me in so I always lived in terror of of when the little bit of fun or freedom that I could have had would be taken away. It was terrible because it was the one thing that I wanted, you know, like connection with other people. And it was always taken away. Somebody would be nice to me for a short while and then behind my back they would go and snitch on me about something I had said. Maybe I would think what used to happen was when I grew a little bit more confident, thinking that, oh, this person has formed a little bit of a bond with me, maybe I could be a bit more honest about what I'm thinking. Not anything outrageous, but just and maybe, maybe I don't agree with um, terrorist attacks or maybe I don't agree with totalitarian regimes or something like that, you know. And because they and then, agreed with terrorists, oh, they attacks. absolutely loved it. Yes, yes. that's exactly what they they wanted the world to be like that, and they wanted. Well, my dad wanted to be a Stalin or a Mao or a Pol Pot. I understand. And he really looked up to them almost as much as he expected us to look up to him. And we also had to 
treat these people with deference. We couldn't say anything bad about them. Pol Pot was not a mass murderer. He was a good man who was lied about by the West, that kind of thing. It's unbelievable. I know. And I, f I really found that really hard because I have always hated nastiness and injustice and violence and that kind of thing. I've always found it difficult to sort of agree with that, even if someone tries to say that there's a good reason for it. I mean, I can't stand any form of injustice, injustice or unpleasant. I mean, I can't stand anything like even thought of say somebody going to prison it makes me very upset even if there's a reason for it i still think surely there's a better way you can be kinder you don't have to do it that way how was your father able to recruit new women well he didn't recruit anybody new once i was born it was previous to that that he recruited people but by then he wasn't recruiting new people he kind of said oh he he had he'd done with that because right. I think the real reason was he was afraid that a new person would report to the authorities what was going on about how how there was a child in the house who wasn't being treated well. Where are like families of all these women worried? They, they tried to get involved, but they were just pushed away, you know. And like when my grandmother, my mum's mum, came to the house, and I mean, she hadn't been given the address, but I think she hired a private detective to find out what was going daughter, yeah. where her daughter is. Was this after the... Um, so this was before, uh, this was in, before I was born, I think. And my mum said to her, I have no mother. So it was that kind of thing. If they, if they rang the doorbell and they looked out of the window and saw who it was, they just pretend there was nobody in the house. And neighbours, were they concerned or like reporting stuff? No, they were always, they were also... They were always lied to about what was actually going on. And I think neighbours did wonder. And that's why my dad used to say their fascist agents don't tell them anything, even if they're nice, because he was worried that they would ask questions. Like when my mum killed herself, the neighbour who had talked to her quite a few times asked where what happened to her. And they told her, oh, she had moved to Birmingham. And nobody asked any questions. So at what point uh, you realized something was wrong and you were like planning to maybe leave the house? Well, I'd realized that something was wrong pretty much early on. First of all, because of the injustice that was going on, people lying about others and getting other people beaten up and the, the cruelty in the house and the cruelty that was displayed towards other people. Do you have and an example of that? Did you had enough food and stuff or? Oh yeah, food was okay. But to me, the, the cruelty was someone like seeing somebody being treated so badly, you know, being forced to kneel on the floor and everybody standing around and cursing them in front of everybody, shaming them, banishing them. And then nobody would speak to that person and they would be crying and it was like, I thought that was just so wrong. And that used to happen to me, and I used to see it happening to other people. I wouldn't take part when it happened to other people, but it was, I just thought it was so bad. And then his values, also like supporting terrorist attacks, supporting the Tiananmen Square massacre, anything like that. I just, I found it horrific when I was in my, right, 10, 11 years old. They used to talk about, what their lives were like when when they were children my dad and my stepmom used to talk about it about what they did at school or whatever and i used to think that life sounds a lot nicer than what the kind of life i'm living why why can't i have fun as well and go and, to school you never yeah, been exactly and when i looked out of the window i used to see kids playing on the swing or having a birthday party and i was not allowed to have any of that and it was that sort of made me also ask questions as to why is everything so unpleasant all the time? Why are people nasty all the time? Why do people report others and gleefully torture other people? 
And why was the atmosphere so unpleasant that nobody liked one another? That was one of the things that I was aware of from a very young age, that nobody liked one another in that house. There was no Warm. sort of yeah. connection at all. And the only time that they came together, like two people would come together in order to build a case to punish a third person. That used to happen quite often. There, everybody was okay with it. Like Yeah, they were all okay with it. And they came together as a group only when there was what they would call an attack from the fascist state, like a neighbour playing loud music or the landlord asking for the rent, that kind of thing. Then suddenly, oh, we are all together. We are all here. We are all one. All together against another. Yeah, yeah against the outside. But they hated each other more than they hated anyone else. Because they were so jealous if AB gave one of the women attention. Yeah, it was. there was terrible jealousy between the women. It was absolutely horrendous but what was it that, a, that all the women were so obsessed with him was he like a good looking man or was he, he like he was not he was ugly oh. and toothless and smelly and he used to snore and fart oh. and yet they seemed to think he was some form of god it was like as if his words i don't know if you've read lord of the rings yes but the voice of saruman do you remember that yes a very like deep Voice? Yeah, and he was able to, he like had almost like a magic in his voice where when he spoke, you would, even if you came there to challenge him for murdering your whole family, he would somehow convince you that what he did was right and you would be convinced. And that was what it was like. It was like his voice was able to convince them that he was a gorgeous, handsome, beautiful man worthy of their worship and their devotion and their loyalty unto death. At what moment you realized this cult leader was your father? Um, well, I had always guessed because there was no other man around and my mum was obsessed about him. So I thought he's probably my dad. And I think sometimes he kind of almost hinted it like we are, we are connected or something like that. It was almost like we we know that we're connected, but we mustn't tell my wife. Basically, that's. And how did you knew which woman of all the women was your mum? Because told you? no, it was when I was twelve, and we had issues about finding somewhere to live, and my dad said that maybe if we struggled to find somewhere to live, that I could go and live with her, go with my mum to her mother's place. And and then he showed me, um, not a birth certificate, but something where it was written down that when they said relationship to child, it said mother. And it was almost like, this wasn't real, but we had to do this because that's what the world expects. So I, I, I then I sort of filled in the, filled in the gaps in my mind. My stepmother hates me so much, and this woman is claiming to be my mother, but it's not my mother. But I thought probably she is my mother. And in time, they did tell me that she was pregnant with me. So it was like yeah. this cult has been your place for 30 years but then you decided that it was enough can you talk us through well, well i started as i said when i was like around even when i was nine, ten, i sort of started asking questions and i think i had always asked questions because i didn't like the violence that was the first thing and i didn't like the atmosphere it was so toxic and unpleasant So I was kind of always knowing that I don't like it, but then questioning myself because it was like everybody else around me likes it. So I should try to like it. There must be something wrong with me because I'm the odd one out. But deep down, I knew I wasn't the odd one out. I was actually in the right. I always knew I was right. I tried to convince myself that I wasn't right. But then when I started doing reading books that I wasn't allowed to read, and it was like, Where did you get the books from? Well, my dad had so many books because he was trying to impress his followers and also impress 
the relatives, when the, like his brother used to come and visit from Singapore once in a while, and he wanted him to think of him as some... Intellectual. Like, yeah, great yeah. intellectual. But you stole some books. Yeah, so I used to read books in secret and read newspapers and magazines and all sorts of stuff when nobody was looking or like when I was getting changed, I used to take half an hour to get changed and <laughs> because I was busy reading. And when I started reading, I, it what I was reading confirmed to me that this is not right, you know, this is not the way we should be. And so I kept questioning it and kept like militating against it in my own head, but not I was not able to say it out loud because I knew that I'd be punished if I said it out loud. So it, it was kind of a rebellion, a long drawn out rebellion for me. Even though I left age 30, I had already left in my mind many, many years before that. Can you tell us about the first time leaving the house? When I was 22, I ran away from home. So what came before that was that there had been a great increase in the aggression towards other people and the bad mouthing and bad attitudes towards other people, like towards neighbors and towards people by my dad. And it was like, I had have, have had enough of this. I do not want to live in a place where everybody is full of hate and anger all the time. I just do not like this anymore. And and then I realized that I started becoming very angry and hateful as well because I was in that atmosphere. To other and women. Yes, towards yeah. other people. Like I used to get really, because, I mean, I suppose I was angry because they were meant to be my friends and then they'd betray me. So I used to get angry but then I thought to myself, if I'm behaving like that, I am, even though subsequently when I have talked about this to other people, they've said, yes, but you, it, what you did was right. Your ang anger was righteous. But to me, I felt that I was becoming like them while fighting against what they were doing. And I had a horrific dream one day when... I In this dream, I had finally managed to escape the house and I ran up to a neighbor who I had had a crush on. Because you saw him from the window. Yeah, uh. in the, and in the dream, I ran up to him, finally free and able to meet him without sneaking peeks from behind the window. And he looked at me with absolute horror. And I thought to myself, what, what on earth? What? Why is he looking at me like that? And then I looked into the... I looked at the door which I had just left, which was like a, a glass pane, and I saw my reflection, and it was the Witch King from Lord of the Rings looking back at me. And it was like, uh-oh, I'm finally becoming like that. I'm becoming like them. You know, and I thought, you know, I have to get out of here. And I don't know how to get out of here. I don't have any knowledge of the world outside, but I have to get out of here. So... So I did. I ran away and I was carrying all my writings and stuff with me, heavy bags. So someone asked me, do you, do, you, do you need any help? And I kind of said I ran away from home. And They said, maybe go to the police station and you might be able to get some help. So I did. Cut the long story short, I ended up going home because I didn't know how to do the basic things. I didn't even know how to use money. And I didn't know how to, absolutely did not know how to get on a bus or a train or even cross a busy road or anything like that. It was completely, completely alien to me. At that point, you decided to return. Well, they, the people in the police station said that if, if you don't return, then your family might put out a missing persons request and then we would have to do all sorts of things to try to solve that problem. So maybe the best thing would be just to ring them and tell them and ask them to collect you. Because I did not say what was going on in the house. I didn't tell them because I, from to me, 
it was like all of them were happy living in that way, even though I think it was appalling, but they were happy. And I don't want to, I thought to myself, I don't want to ruin their fun. If they like to live like that, they can live like that. All I want is to get out of it. I don't want to report and get them into trouble. I just want to, I just want to live in a different way. And, but unfortunately it was a bank holiday Monday. I didn't think all these things through and the, the council places were not open where you could go and register to find somewhere to live or something like that. So they said, why not just go back and talk about it? They kind of thought I was like a tearaway yes, young person like a rebel, who, had just, yeah. Yeah, who just ran away because I had a tiff with my parents or something like that. But, but then I thought, yeah, okay, maybe I will do that because they were terrified of the police. And I thought now that the police are involved, probably they might give me more freedom, but that was not to happen. What was their reaction? When they came to pick me up from the police station, they were crying and hugging me as if, as if they were the perfect angels. And that was all an act obviously for the police. And I think. Josie, who was one of the cult members, I think she was probably, probably meant it because she wasn't a bad person, but she just totally believed so much in the cult. And she really thought that the cult was the right place for me and that I wasn't safe outside that situation. So, and when I went home for the first time ever, my stepmother hugged me and that made me think, oh, maybe, maybe it really isn't so bad after all. Maybe they just needed a wake up call. It wasn't to be, they, after a few days, I was called a traitor and a renegade and all sorts of things like that. Are you afraid for your life? Yes, I was terrified. It was like, what am I going to, what are they going to do to me next? So I sort of gave up. And also, I also knew that when I went out, I wasn't able to function on my own. I was a, so I called myself a cage bird with clipped wings because I wasn't able to function on my own. It was like, maybe I am too disabled to live a independent life. Maybe, maybe it's best to just stay here. But I never really gave up hope of going again when the time was right. It was just, I had done it at the wrong time and that's why it, it went pear shaped. Tell us about that. When the time was right. It it kind of, when was the time right? I didn't know. I didn't sort of plan anything, but it kind of, it just kind of happened because later on, about five years after I escaped for the first time, my stepmother's sister had some issues. She had breast cancer and then she broke her leg and because of that, she, she required more support. And my stepmother started demanding that the other cult members help more and more. I mean, she was the one who was acknowledged for looking after her sister, but she never did any work. It was all the other cult members. The work was all done by the other cult members. They were treated like slaves and made to do things that they shouldn't really have been doing and also my stepmother's sister was kept more disabled than she needed to be because if she had done physio and things I think she would have been all right but then their their whole carefully constructed facade would have fallen apart if she had regained some independence so they kept her more disabled than she ever needed to be sort of as a so yeah, so they didn't ever encourage her to do any exercise, to do any, to learn to do anything by herself. So that people had to, literally, she was almost like she was paralyzed, even though she wasn't. And when she went to the hospital, she was becoming a lot stronger. Her arms were becoming a lot stronger and she was able to do things for herself. But as soon as she came back to the house, they, they stopped all that and sort of made her sit there like a vegetable all day long and they claimed to care so much about her but it was only because she was convenient for them she was an ideal cover for their what they were doing because you in the past she used to get epileptic fits and she 
wasn't getting them anymore, but they used to say if anybody asked questions, oh, we're looking after a disabled person who gets epileptic fits, and if she gets problems, you will be responsible for it. So stay away. Yes. And pe- that was good to anybody who had any compassion would probably think, oh, they just need some space, you know. But that was not what was going on. That that was a very clever ruse yes. for what was actually going on. So Josie was being bullied nonstop by my stepmother and she was being lied about and treated just treated very badly. Like for example, she was expected to lift her sister. I mean my stepmother's sister, she was expected to lift her and she was getting problems with her arm from having to lift her. And she never said she wouldn't do it, but she kind of said, Will it be all right if I have a break? And I remember on one occasion when she was having a lot of pain in her arm, when Josie was having a lot of pain in her arm and Chanda, my stepmother, asked her to do something and she said, yes, I will do it, but can I just have a a few minutes to rest my arm? She was in no way saying she doesn't want to do it. She was just saying, my arm's hurting. Is it all right? You know, like anybody would. And a reasonable person would say, of course. But... And then later on, a couple of hours later, my dad came charging into the room and just smacked Josie and smashed her all over the face and all, all around the place. And it was like, what? What's going on? And she said, and, he's, and my dad shouted, how dare you violate Chanda's authority? You said you, said you won't do something that she asked you to do, you refused to do something she asked you to do, which was completely not the truth. And then another cult member, Aisha, came in and she got beaten up just for being there, just for coming into the room. That was the kind of thing that would happen at any time, you know, and it was absolutely horrendous. So Josie started feeling very upset about what was going on and she really wanted to... I think she wanted to change things, but she didn't know, quite know how. And she hated my stepmother for being such a bully. I used to show her a lot of compassion. Because obviously, even though Josie was very unkind to me many times, I can't stand to see someone suffering. And even if they'd been unkind to me, it doesn't mean I would be unkind to them. Because then that's me being unkind, you know. So I used to hug her and provide her with a shoulder to cry on and she started becoming very sort of thankful for that so I said to her on one occasion I said but this you know what Chanda does to you and that you don't like do you remember that you used to do that to me and then she thought yeah I did you know and that's that's not good is it and so she started kind of becoming a bit kinder as a person so I thought maybe I will be able to get her to help me because I needed help. I couldn't just do it on my own. I needed help if I was to escape. I also knew that I needed some sort of a halfway house in order to learn the basic life skills, which I had not learned before, like how to use money, how to travel about, how to... All the basic stuff. Just the basic things, you know. And then in 2013... There was a, I saw a leaflet from Centerpoint, which was about young people who who came from abusive households and who needed a halfway home. I thought to myself, that would be great if I could have something like that. So I told Josie about it and she said, oh, she would look into it. But previous to that, I had started to lose weight rapidly. And Josie was worried about me, especially in the light of the people who had died in the past. And she had tried to tell my dad and stepmom that I think there's something wrong with this girl. And they said, oh, no, she's just she's just obsessed about looking slim so that she looks nice and fashionable. She's like she's got an eating disorder or something like that. And she's just 
there's nothing wrong with her. But I was losing weight rapidly and Josie was really worried. On one occasion, she said, maybe I should just take you to the hospital when your dad and stepmom are not here. And I said, but I'm not going to go to the hospital in order to come back to this place. If I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave. I want to leave. And I said that, in this was early in 2013, I said, I'm going to leave this house by the end of 2014, either alive or dead. And she kind of took that seriously. And also because she hated my stepmother, I t also told her that it was my stepmother who was responsible for me being treated so badly. Josie thought, yes, that, that is exactly what it was. If I had said that it was AB who was responsible, she wouldn't have gone along. But because I said it was her rival and her bully who was responsible, then she was happy to go along. And I thought, well, I know it is AB, but it's also Chanda, so it's not exactly a lie, it's the truth, it's just not all of it. Mm -hmm. And I just, and I know that sounds very cunning and manipulative, but I had to survive, you know, and it was the only way that I was going to get out was if I had said that AB was the problem, she would never have helped me. So she helped you? So, yes, she decided she was going to help me. And so I suggested that she bought a mobile phone because if if we were to use the landline, which was being paid for by Chanda, then she would know what numbers we had called. So... When she was calling Centerpoint, she was doing that on the on public telephone outside. And then we wanted to contact other people because Centerpoint was not available for people of my age. And I was 30 at that time. So it was like, we wanted something like that, but for people yeah. of my age. And then one day in October, 2013 it's 10 years ago now she Josie and I with the rest of the cult we were watching the six o'clock news we had to do that that was one of the things we were compelled to do and there was an item about forced marriages she had a helpline and said if you have any issues along these lines you could call this number so both of us memorized it not thinking that it would be of any use because it wasn't the, exactly the same situation, but we thought anything might be right. So let's, let's memorize it and see what happens. When AB and Chanda, my dad and stepmom went out shopping, we called the number and we finally managed to arrange for someone to come and pick us up. Both of you. Yes, both of us, because Josie, even though she loved AB, she thought that I couldn't survive on my own because I was very ill and also had no knowledge of the world outside. So she thought she would come along. Yeah, I don't think I quite got this. But I think the idea was she'd help me to set up and then she'd go back. Yes. But I was hoping, I didn't... I thought maybe that's what she meant, but I wasn't 100% sure. And I was just hoping that if she could see what life was like, how we could live, she wouldn't want to go back. And obviously, I was mistaken about that, but that's she another story. Oh, yeah. But how was it the first time you, they picked you up? What was this moment? Yeah, it was, it was absolutely fantastic. It was like, I couldn't really believe it was real because... I don't know, so many things have happened and so many nice things have been taken away from me that I struggle to believe that anything good is actually happening. It's like, I don't know, because I don't want to be disappointed. I don't believe that it's real. So, yes, I knew it was real and it was great, but I didn't quite believe that it was real. How was it for you to see the world again? And all this basic stuff. Well, it was wonderful, but it was also, I also learned something which was not very nice. One, well, one thing, one of many things that was not very nice. And that was 
but I was very disabled. I had a lot of mobility issues and I didn't know how to get from A to B. And even till this day, I can't really get anywhere without Google Maps. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, um, I don't know if that's because of I have dyspraxia or whether it was just because of being stuck in the house or maybe a bit of both. What were the other challenges? Because well, you you, you well, stayed in a house or oh oh I stayed in a in a yeah when you hostel. came out of the cult and I suppose one of the one of the biggest challenges was the fast pace of life I found I find everything too fast because literally I was staring at four walls for thirty years and all this busyness and frantic activity i found it completely overwhelming and i at the beginning i suffered from so much sensory overload and like headaches and all sorts of stuff when confronted with endless activities and a great deal of sensory input so though it was great it was also quite unpleasant in some ways because it was such a shock to be in a completely different situation. But this organization helped you to get a place and... Yeah, helped you. and helped me to learn to get around on my own, which was because when I first came out of the car, I didn't know how to get from A to B. There was just no way. I had no sense of direction at all and just felt everything was just so big and so weird and so strange. And did they also, like, call the police after hearing your story? Well, the police got involved. I didn't kind of want that because, as I said before, I didn't want to... I didn't want anyone to get into trouble. I just wanted to be out of there. And But the police got involved. They, there were plainclothes police around when I was rescued from the cult. And that was not... That I thought that, that I was told that there would be plainclothes police, but I thought that would just be to ensure that there was no aggression or violence or anything, just in case my dad and stepmom decided to come back and confronted us when we were get going out. But they were arrested, right, a month later? They were arrested later on, yes. Because of? Um, my dad had a number of charges, but the ones relating to me were were child cruelty and false imprisonment. What was the charge? Like how many years? Oh, he got 23 years in prison. 23 years. How was this for you? Well, I I don't believe in prison, to be honest. To me, it felt more like revenge than anything else because I'd known what it felt like to spend all my life in prison. And I didn't want to be responsible for someone else spending time in prison. You know, I don't, I didn't, that was not what I wanted to see. I just wanted to be free. That was what I wanted. I didn't want revenge. I wanted to be free. Have you ever spoke to him again? Or no, I didn't. And I did not speak to him again, unfortunately, because I didn't kind of know how to make it happen. And usually the prisoner has to ask for information. I don't know if people can just give out information without the prisoner wanting that information and I didn't know how to go about it and it's too late now because he he died last year so in prison yes does it make you feel sad that you never yes asked? it does yes well it I kind of held out hope that there may be a kind of reconciliation at one point because he wasn't all bad I mean he could be really nice on his own and they all could it was when they were in a group setting, they turned into like something else. It was like they turned into a many-headed monster. But each person on their own was all right. If you could get them on their own and talk to them as a fellow human being, there was still a human being there who was capable of being decent and kind. But when they were in that setting... It was like the ideology did something to them and it kind of changed them. Was after he was imprisoned, was your stepmother also imprisoned? No, she was she wasn't charged because there wasn't there wasn't enough evidence really to charge her because her kind of abuse was not 
you know what I mean? She didn't slap us or anything like that. She was just cold and cruel and coercive and she knew how to she knew how to make you feel like a, a piece of dirt just with one look but you had to be like a um like a witness in the trials right i did yes. yes and also other cult members no the other cult members refused to take part in well actually that's not quite right josie wanted to be a witness for the defense but she wasn't called because and she kept saying oh that's because the fascist state had already set everything up but the reason why she was not a credible witness the way she talked it would only have helped the prosecution because it, when you listen to her it is so clear she's brainwashed she'd talk about things like invisible mind control machines and stuff like that which sounds absolutely bizarre yeah because uh, pointing out that there mm. was like this machine called jackie yes sorry to tell us this <laughs> short story because it's so crazy yeah well my dad i don't know if he actually believed it or maybe more like he said it to manipulate and coerce people and then he kind of almost believed it himself there was he believed that there was this mind control machine called jackie who followed his every dictate and who was able to create natural disasters in the world and who was able to read minds and punish people and that kind of thing and he used to say that the people who died in the house my mum and the woman who died from a stroke and the man who died from cancer that was because they were punished by Jackie for not following AB properly Sounds so and he used crazy. that yeah, I know and he used that to keep the other people in line you believe in jackie me yes oh no oh. i don't but i think the other cult members definitely did and i'm i can be i can almost be 100 certain that josie still does so you're talking about still does how how are the cult members now have you ever spoke to them again um well the, all i know about josie is that she goes around well when my dad was still alive campaigning saying that he was a he was a great man and a great leader who was being unjustly persecuted by the fascist state she blamed you for being a witness well she blamed me for the whole thing she said that i lied because i didn't get my way about this or that or you know even though she knew it was all true but she saw me as a traitor because i was meant to keep quiet about what was going on in the house and i suppose if i had died like my mum or one of the others that was a price worth paying because nothing is more important for a a cult follower than the cult and the individual is only worthy as long as they're part of that cult and if they're not then they're disposable so you never spoke to any of the other women um no i well i haven't spoke i would love to speak to josie but she she doesn't want to speak to me i Aisha came out and she's she's doing quite well she's doing a degree now she's 79 and she's doing a degree in arabic oh so i think that's really good yes but now she's become almost fanatically muslim so i think she has always needed a kind of belief system to hold on to she she cannot she's not like me she can't sort of think for herself basically she needs someone else to tell her how to think and how do you feel like because it must be hard that not that you don't like have a family or any yeah people your childhood um well no not really i've i've always been sort of all right on my own i've well i have got i've got a lot of people in my life who are to me i call them soul family so it's family of choice not blood family but family of choice and what are you doing now for a living um uh yeah i'm a pet sitter yes and i also travel around a lot i'm i have been training to be a tefl teacher so that's teaching english as a foreign language so that i can travel the world that's nice and i uh, yeah i travel i travel solo i go buses trains planes everything all on my own also the first time in a plane and everything yeah i went 
for the first time to Mallorca in 2019 oh, and then to Vienna. Oh, I loved it. It was gorgeous. I, I'm thinking about seeing the world for the first time and maybe like what was new for you, like the traffic, but also maybe people or animals or can um, you tell us about that? Well, everything was new really and I loved everything, but I found pace of life very hard at first because it was too, everything was too too quick yes and i couldn't take it in and i still struggle with that in some ways it's like everything is three or four times too fast for me and the dogs oh i love dogs <laughs> i go i'm a pet sitter so i go around looking after people's animals when they're on holiday and i love it so much oh, though i can't have a dog of my own because where i live we're not allowed to keep dogs. I do have dogs because I look after other people's dogs sometimes for a couple of weeks and I, I love it so much. And they dogs love me so much. Mm -hmm. They're always so cuddly and cute and <laughs> snuggling up with me and it's just heavenly. I want I, I would like to get three dogs really. I and mean, I th I see myself as an old woman. I have three dogs. I've got a Samoyed, I've got a Black Lab, and I've got a Husky. Husky. Oh, my God. I'm going to show you a picture of my dog when we're in Leithani. <laughs> you would, you probably like her a lot. Aww. So your story is incredible and unbelievable. Thank um, you. With your story, what advice or insight would you like to share? Um, I think, for me personally, I think that... Not holding on, on to anger and hatred is the most important thing because life is too short for that nonsense. And you hear a lot of people who are bogged down by the past, like when something happens to them, they just hold on to it and they hold on to grudges. And, and then they will say, oh, I'm feeling very poorly. And, you know, and to me, it's like, can you not see that they're linked? If you're holding on to anger, which is toxic, you're harming yourself. You are, you're not harming anybody else. You're not harming the person you're holding a grudge against. You're harming yourself. We need to forgive and move on. Have you forgiven your... I father? have, yes, yes, definitely. It's very important because if you don't forgive, then you are, like Nelson Mandela said, if you hold on to hatred and bitterness, then you are still in prison. And it's like, I've already wasted 30 years of my life. I don't want to waste any more time. So beautiful. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to Day Survives. Let us know what you think of this episode. If you're inspired by this unique and extraordinary survival story, please follow or subscribe to our podcast and check out our social media for more stories like these. Until next time, take care and don't miss the next episode. They, they opened fire and they started shooting everybody. One of them aimed his gun towards me and he fired at me. It was completely covered in blood and there were dead bodies around me. They were looking in dead bodies, in injured, oh. yes. like they, they couldn't find me. My dad was standing there and just praying and hoping that, you know, um, my name is not on the list. I was told by my doctors that I was shot eight times. Yeah, 132 children had lost their lives in, in that incident.